Welcome to Classroom 5.0, a podcast that uncovers industry insights, cutting-edge research and practical evidence-based strategies that help us all to imagine and design learning environments and pathways for this ever-evolving world so that together we can best support the next gen to uncover and deliver their unique potential. This episode has been recorded from our hometown of Port Macquarie, which we're grateful to share and enjoy alongside the traditional owners of Beer Pie Country, whose ongoing cultures and connections to lands and waters we celebrate, and whose elders, past, present and emerging, we pay our respect to. I'm Marianne Power, co-founder of the Posify Group and your host for today's episode, and I am so excited to be joined by my good friends, I can proudly say, Courtney Kovac and Kieran Deck, for a rich and juicy conversation about something that we're all born with, our health, (laughs) need to learn how to nurture. It's something that Every single one of us as parents, as teachers, as adults of young people, it's a hot topic right now, and I'm so glad that these two young superstars can join us. So let's learn a little bit about them. Courtney is a passionate mental health professional working in preventative education. As a senior program content and delivery coordinator at Batia, Courtney designs and develops stigma-reducing mental health programs that empower young people to have more open and honest conversations about mental health. Her partner, Kieran, is the founder and host of Secret Ninja School, whose mission is to build confidence and competence in movement for children and ensure that they develop a desire to make sport a daily part of their lives. Ninja School has just gotten started and has already been adopted by more than 200 Australian schools who are using the five to 10 minute adventure workouts for fun and engaging classroom movement breaks. So if you haven't got it amongst it already, I highly recommend that you do. Kieran has over 11 years experience as a sports coach of young children in sports like Auskick, Taekwondo, cricket and gymnastics. And as a former cricket and Taekwondo athlete, he describes himself as having a deep love for movement that will last a lifetime. He says he built these connections as a young person due to positive role models, which I'm sure we'll get to hear about today. Kieran and Courtney. It's been long overdue. Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. We're so excited. It's so good to see you. Oh, it's so exciting to have you here. And I must admit, (laughs) I was kind of half anticipating that there might be a jungle or a beach or a hut behind you because (laughs) while some of us, to give context, have been living through this pandemic stay-at-home season and, you know, New South Wales has literally just emerged. Our friends in Victoria are still huddling under their blankets. You two are literally hashtag living the van life so tell me where are you joining us from right now we are currently in port douglas so far north queensland (laughs) and it's um we've actually had our first bit of rain today but it's super beautiful because it's just brought out the vibrancy of all the the green leafy goodness around here so yeah we're very 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 lucky so she swapped out Port Macquarie for Port Douglas. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Courtney, yeah. you and I met here in Port Macquarie. And, uh, you know, for, for those of you who have been following the Bossify group journey for a while, you might recognize Courtney. She was actually <laughs> one of the very first young people that worked alongside us when we were my plot before the Bossify group even began. Oh, yeah. gosh, I remember those days. Yeah, it was so beautiful. I was, um, you know, as we were getting excited to chat with you today, I was thinking about just how much of a positive influence you and, and Jen have had on my life. So I'm just, yeah, I'm super excited to be chatting with you guys today and to be doing it with Kieran as well, because we've had a long journey together. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, what well, we have and then you have and then we've all come yeah. together and have a long journey. about. But, you know, what I love about the two of you and um, thank you, that's so kind of you. Uh, it's really been a pleasure for Jenna and I because to watch you grow into the person that, you know, I remember saying to you, this is who you were born to be. Your purpose just was was so there the minute that I saw you, this <laughs> bursting bubble of joy and optimism and hope and light for the world. So to see you step into the mental health space, I still remember that call. You said, guess what, Mass? I got the job at the <laughs> Yeah, I was like, no, stop it. I'm not going to lie. There was a tiny little piece of me that was like, no. <laughs> but it was only tiny. Oh, it's just the, it's the perfect, perfect, perfect place for you. So let's dive in and hear all about what you're doing. Um, but before we do, back to van life because, you know, it's been getting a little bit of a mixed rap right now and I'm really curious to hear from your perspective, you know, what's been the highs, what's been the lows, what's been the challenges and what have you learned? What are you learning? 
Well, maybe I'll jump in here, Maz. I think, um, like, we were having our conversation this morning about, like, okay, cool, Maz has got some awesome questions. We need to have a bit of a think about, like, where we're at with with these questions right now because, obviously, our journey is ever-changing um, and uh, how we are approaching this van life thing is is ever changing too. We set out on it because we were initially like wondering, like, is this it? We were in our little tiny Sydney apartment. Courtney was doing two hours of commuting a day to get to her office. Yeah. Um, I, working for myself, was spending all my time at home anyway and then COVID sent Courtney into um, into the same situation. And, um mm. Yeah, walking along the beach this morning, having a discussion about what we're going to talk about today, it, we just we just realised how much gratitude we have for this beautiful country that we live in. Um, you know, the tropics are great, but we've 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 had the chance to explore all these amazing places with and meet people who are doing things a bit differently. And um, until you get exposed to people who are shaking it up, it doesn't feel like there's any other possibilities. There's a lot of luck to our situation in terms of um, Courtney uh, worked really hard to get into her latest job, which allows her to be remote full time because her previous job didn't allow that. But that was the catalyst, wasn't it, for us? Yeah. Like taking the leap, and then and we we had to we had to take a bunch of sacrifices to do it. Um, but walking on the beach, uh, the the financial sacrifices that we've made, me not having a day to day job for instance, mm-hmm. um, are just all worth it because there's there's just so many beautiful moments with people and place that you just don't have if you don't take the risk and put yourself out there. Yeah, and we're like doing this feels like we're living our values as well. It feels like we're, um, you know, we have balance in our life. Like it's not all about work as much as we love work and, you know, it's very meaningful and purpose driven for us. It's not the, it's not everything and, and being able to immerse in nature and um, be a part of different communities is so important to us. And we're able to live that here. Um, And, you know, there are of course challenges because we're moving around all the time. So trying to get into a really like, productive workflow can be challenging at times um but we you know when you love what you're doing it's not as hard um as perhaps if you if you weren't loving what you're doing so we are really really lucky in that sense um and we're missing family like we you know we're such big family people so I think being away from them for a long time is um, definitely the hardest part of this life, but it's replaced by other beautiful relationships that we wouldn't be making if we weren't doing this. So it's really lovely. <laughs> oh, it's just lovely. And I have to ask, who's doing the cooking? Oh, oh me. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> but Kieran's really good at the dishes, so I would much prefer <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's nice to hear that it's swapped. Oh, and I heard yeah. you speak about nature before, Courtney, and that's also something that that has struck me as something that's stayed with you since I've known you is just that love of nature. I remember you wrote a blog post for us years back on the importance of connecting with nature. And similarly, Kieran, you know, since getting to know you, understanding that this has been a lifelong journey is this understanding of physical health, and mental health, and how the two intertwine, and you stepping specifically into helping young people with, with their physical health. But I'm curious because you know that here at Posify, we help young people to try and identify their skills, their strengths and values so that that whole life after school question isn't as daunting. Can you tell us a little bit about your own stories, what it was like to move from school and into what you're doing now, what that looked like? Mm. Well, you cook, so you go first. (laughs) (laughs) You can clean up with the dishes. (laughs) That is such a good question. I think... You know, I'd be lying to say if you, like you and Jen had such a huge influence on, on my life from university transitioning into the, the workforce. Um, cause when I was at school, I didn't really know what I, what I wanted to do. I knew that like at, in my, at my core, I wanted to help people. Um, like I've always been kind of that way inclined. 
And so I knew that I wanted to do something with that. But like you look at all your traditional kind of like avenues and you're like, where do I fit? Like, how do I, how do I do that? And which one kind of suits me the most? And, um, so I went into studying psychology, which I feel like is a natural transition when you kind of have that drive to help others. Um, but I, I didn't love my psych degree. Like I found that it was a really kind of heavy focus on, um, treatment and I was really interested in, um, you know, how do we actually prevent people from falling in the first place? How do we give them the skills to thrive and, um, you know, like live a fulfilling life? And I think that when I was starting to kind of question those things is when I came across you um, at the Luminosity Youth Summit and I saw you do um, a big talk about purpose and and changing up the education system and I was like, yes. <laughs> 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 yes, you were. I still remember yes. sitting in the in the workshop afterwards because we followed yeah. on. And your big eyes. It's like, wow, who's this girl? She's really rocking this whole mindfulness purpose. Thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just was Aww. like, I'd never heard anyone talk with kind of like the passion and optimism that you had. And I felt like it reflected my like inner spirit that I hadn't really been able to bring out yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, like just learning from you and, and meeting you and Jen and working on my plot with you kind of like shot me in this direction where I was like, no, I, I want to work with young people and I want to help them to, um, understand themselves and give them the skills to be able to navigate the world and, and that sort of stuff. And so, yeah, I got really lucky. I, um, applied for a role as a casual facilitator with Batir. So, um, we run preventative mental health programs and I was talking to young people about mental health, which just seems like such a daunting thing, but man, is it fun? Like it's just yeah. such a rewarding thing. Um, and so, yeah, transitioned from that role into a bookings role where I got to work really closely with teachers and kind of understand their needs and how we could support them. And just a big shout out for teachers like far out oh, there, absolute heroes. <laughs> if I can just interject there for a second, you glide over the beginning of that career, but um, like to an example of you finding your purpose pushing you was I got to watch as Courtney battled with this fear of getting up in front of people that she had, you know, her purpose pushed her through it. And it was like, she just totally undersells herself through that early (laughs) stage. It was not easy, but because she found a purpose, she was able to get up and make a big difference in those early days. And then it continued. That's so true. When you have a strong enough why, everything seems seems worth it, doesn't it? All the stress and the the worry, it's like, okay, (laughs) I'm doing this for a reason, so I have to push through it. So... Yes, thank you. <laughs> that was a very, very reasonable and um, not reasonable, uh, insightful correction there, I think, and, and addition. And the other one, if, if it's okay to point to, is I've heard you speak a little bit about luck. And, um, you know, I, I'm curious about that concept of luck because somebody once said to me that rather than luck, it's about looking at, you know, where opportunity and hard work collide. And then you've got this beautiful example that, you know, you put purpose in the center of that and the world's your oyster, you know, Mm, and for both of you, I just think you're such incredible examples of what it's like to, um, yeah, to, to be humble, to be standing in this place of I'm ready for this next part of my journey, to be looking outside of where you are right now, to be seeking um, ideas and inspiration from other people, but then to be, to be really putting that from your position and then out, you know, how can I reflect my potential in a way that's meaningful for other people? Um, yeah, it's, that's it's true. beautiful to watch. Mm. I, uh, I love that quote about luck. I, I think that's, that's mm. largely true. I think, um, I, I think there's a big part of maybe maybe gratitude is a better word for luck yeah. in terms of like, you know, we're born into this country where there is lots of opportunity. Um, but then having, having travelled a bit and gotten and seen some third world countries, the attitude doesn't necessarily need to change. It's still making opportunity with what you have. So like, you know, you can have all of the money in the world, but uh, what are you doing with that level of responsibility? <laughs> yeah, with privilege comes responsibility, absolutely. 
And tell us a little bit about your, your next part in Batir, Courtney. It's <laughs> exciting what you're doing now. Yeah, it's really exciting. I, I honestly can't believe that I'm like in a role that I just absolutely love and can see myself doing for a long time. And I'm only 25. Like it's, it's really, really cool. Um, and that role is I get to design and, and create our mental health programs at Batir alongside a beautiful team who I adore working with. Um, and it's just, it's very, it's very, very fulfilling and very, um, meaningful to me to be able to be creative in a way that is um, using that creativity to help others. It's just such a beautiful symmetry of the things that are important to me. Um, so, yeah, I, I just landed that role. I'm saying it again, luck, 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 <laughs> but I worked very hard <laughs> oh, sure to did. get that role at the beginning of the year um, and my old role was delivery-based, so I had to be based in Sydney, but this one is a national team, so I spoke to my manager and he was fully supportive of me um, working from home. So, yeah, I've, <laughs> I want to say luck again. <laughs> You're right where you need to be and where you deserve to be and yeah. where the young people of Australia <laughs> want you to be. And speaking of, you know, creativity and that program design, you know, you're quite a creative couple. Karen, tell us a little bit about your journey, uh, which will segue, I'm sure, into ninja school, but I'm sure there's some, some bits and bobs beforehand. Yeah, it is uh, like... Yeah, the, the same sort of themes go throughout both of our journeys, I guess, in terms of we are in the right place. Um, and that beautiful analogy of the, 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 the purpose and the hard work smashing together to create something nice. So I, I started out as like a 17 year old who had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do at the end of year 12. Um, and then I, I picked up a magazine um, called Inside Sport Magazine and that like they sh they were writing about my passion, which was sport, in a way that I hadn't read before. It was human focused. It was the struggles behind the athlete, not not about their performances. And that really got me like and so I was like, oh, I want to learn how to write like that. And so that started me out with like maybe I'll do journalism at university, but I didn't even, I couldn't even tell you what journalism was back then. Like uh, what is its purpose? What does a journalist do? Like I wouldn't have been able to answer those questions, but some year advisor suggested I do it. Um, and yeah, I got myself into Bachelor of Journalism at University of Wollongong, which is just as gorgeous as up here in Port Douglas in parts. Mm -hmm. It's just beautiful in that part of the world. Um, and I enjoyed uh, a massive degree where I had a couple of really important lecturers in the same sense that, you know, you were a node for Courtney. Maz, I had uh, a chat with one of my lecturers actually just the other day, seven years since I graduated. Um, we're still wow, in contact. that's amazing. How special is that? Oh, it's just it's really it was so special. special. Mm. Um, but that goes to show the level of commitment they had to their students. We're only a small cohort. And I was lucky enough to, um, yeah, get nurtured into like the purpose of journalism and its, and its, its focus. But probably it's not right for my story to focus too much on the journalism part because I have never been a journalist in that sense. I got an opportunity to work on a documentary, um, straight out of uni, um, at Channel 10 and did a, a bit more than a year of free unpaid work there. Um, but with some really impressive people who had great values as well. Um, and then uh, spent a couple of years uh, presenting news, not strictly a journalist, just a presenter. And that was, that was really intense and um, was disappointed by the, the organization that I was working for there. They had lost their way. They weren't like, they weren't focusing on the tenants of, media like what the responsibility that media has and it was all about like get the story out get the story out get, don't check the facts or don't don't keep your audience in mind and it really got me because that was what I'd been taught at university by these amazing lecturers and so I I left that industry after several years as a producer and sports commentator sojourn along the way there too 
um, to go and pursue my passion as a Taekwondo coach, which I'd been doing the whole time casually. Um, and yeah, it was, it was the least amount of money I'd earned in my career, but the most fulfilled I'd ever been. Um, so I did a couple of years full time creating a community in Canberra, uh, of, at a Taekwondo school, but it was, it, Taekwondo is a bit misleading. That was the vehicle. It was really a really strong community of 70 or so members. Um, a few of us instructing, but everyone was on a level playing field. We all had these great values and, and, and that got rocked by COVID like many people. And that's, how Secret Ninja School evolved. <laughs> I'm not going to let you get away with it just like that. <laughs> Tell me more about that transition. My goodness. Oh, That's, that was long. I'm, uh, uh, I hope that wasn't too boring. But um. Not at all. It was fascinating. <laughs> and uh, there were so many parts of that that were interesting and I didn't know about you actually. And, um, and particularly when you started speaking about that recognition in what others might consider quite a high value job or perceived high value job, you know, presenting for a media company. And yet that strong sense of values kicking in and saying, hang on a second, this isn't where I'm meant to be. And, you know, I'm guessing some questions around, am I really going to be able to have the impact that I went into this for in the first place? If I'm standing with a company that's heading off in a separate direction. Um, and, and now interestingly, th there's this point in time where you've built this beautiful face to face community, COVID hits, face to face goes. Tell me about how Secret Ninja School came about. Where was where was the burning desire there? What was the idea? Like all good things, I think it started with solving a need. Um, so my Zoom classes were going well for the adult population of the community during the initial days of COVID, but the four to seven year group um, were just really struggling, paying attention or enjoying it and um like my philosophy as an instructor has always been if the students aren't enjoying it for whatever reason that's my responsibility that's not their fault that's i take that on board and so i took that as like an opportunity to go hang on like what could we do differently here what does engage them on the screen and um the we were lying down watching disney so yeah. You're watching Soul on Disney Plus. Yeah. That came out like. Oh, wow. Dis the, uh, oh, maybe it was one before that. Yeah. Well, I don't think it was Soul because that was uh, late last yeah. year, but we were about to watch something on Disney Plus or an ad came on for Disney Plus or something, <laughs> something like that. Um, giving them a big rap here. But it, it, I was going to say, no paid advertising here. And, yeah. by the way, this is pre and this is also yeah, pre hashtag van life, right? Like. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, they, so they, they had a, um, uh, it just sparked an idea. I was like, well, the kids are, they love storytelling like all of us. That's what we are wired. We are hardwired to understand storytelling. So what if I put the moves into a story? Maybe they'll still get to progress during this weird pandemic. Mm, um, and, uh, yeah, like uh, we we tried a couple of sessions with a couple of the students, and the feedback was phenomenal. And it was um, it just evolved from there. <laughs> and Kieran also is underselling himself. <laughs> he is one of the <laughs> one of the biggest like doers that I have ever met. Like he, when there's a problem, it's like what can I do to, to do this? Or, okay, maybe something's not moving around. Like, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I'm going to reach out to this person. I'm going to do this. Like, he's just always doing and like nothing kind of stands in the way, which I, I admire. So it was hard and it still is hard starting your own business as you guys, you know, would, would well and truly know. Mm. Um, but it's that like do attitude when the doubt creeps in that, yeah, it has been a pleasure to watch. 
Oh, what I love about the two of you. I just missed that little thank you. Oh, my goodness. I love the fact. I mean, both of you are so, yeah, acknowledging of your own journeys and so humble and to have each other to turn around and go, oh, hang on a second, you're not telling me a story here. Let me just add this rock star bit in. It's just beautiful to watch. <laughs> oh, Can you tell us a little bit about health in education. So many of our listeners right now are really curious about this future of learning and you've both spoken to some really innovative ways that we're mixing up the conversation around mental and physical health. Um, and I love that addition of storytelling with Secret Ninja School. But what are some of the, I guess, findings that you've come across both with mental health and physical health that that surprise you a little bit, that you think that as we move forward and start to again reimagine what the next steps might be, we might want to take into consideration for our learning spaces. The thing that seems to be like a, a theme that we keep coming across and like I, I thought as I was telling the original early parts of my story there that I've appropriated a bunch of words, like I talked about values with um, my early news days, but I'd, I wasn't thinking about values. It was just a feeling that something was wrong. I didn't use intuition. that word. Mm, yeah, yeah, it was an intuition. And so I, I think the thing that's coming across a whole bunch of like the education space, the newish research that we're investigating with Secret Ninja School and Courtney's seeing it in her work too, I know, um, and, I, and I think you guys are too at Posify, is that, the focus is, and I'll sport, talk specifically with sport because that's my arena, but the focus is about outcomes more than the journey. And when you put it in a nutshell like that, it's like an Instagram tile. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a quote that people share and whatnot, but there's so much depth to it. Like I think what is happening is we're, we're waking up to – this last century or so of education that has been the focus, the focus has been, um, all right, guys, we want you to go out there and learn how to kick. This is the way you learn how to kick. If you get good at that, I'll teach you something new. All right. You're good at kicking. Now try and kick, um, with accuracy. All right. Good job. Now try and run and kick. Okay. Good job. Like that's the progression with the beginning phase being the basic, basic and the end phase always in my, in the sports field, most of the time being if you do hard work, you will become the next Pele. You will become the next Ronaldinho of soccer. I don't know why I'm using soccer as an example. <laughs> I am not, I don't watch it. I don't play it. But I just maybe it's popular, but. The, the point is, is that th from the very beginning, the focus is elite. So if you, yeah. if you get good at, enough at this, then you will become the best in the world. Mm. And, um, and I think it's just, it's really sad because it, it the fact is, is that only one or 2% of people, if, I think it's even less than act that actually will mm. ever be professional athletes. It's some umpteenth amount of people will become professional athletes. And so, that's it, that's just backwards because what it does is it says, all right, you, Maz, you are good at kicking. Come and join this elite program. You, Courtney, um, you need a bit of work. You're not mm. ready for the elite program. But the undertone to that is, Courtney, you are not good enough. And Courtney's initial response You're as a six-year-old. Yeah. I give it up. Yeah. What, what other identity can I fit into? Oh, well, I'll go to the creatives or I'll go to the smarties or I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do to, to fit in and ha have my sense of belonging. And so what I think I'm hearing from you is to what would it, you know, moving forward, what might it look like if rather than thinking about our physical education or our, um, I guess I'm hearing more of a flavor of, um, how can we redesign things so that sport is a part of everyday life and that movement is a part of our day in a way that kids intuitively want to move towards movement, not for mm -hmm. the outcome of getting somewhere, but for the joy of participation? The joy of life. Like life is about enjoyment. It's not about getting to whatever outcome you want to get to. You know, it's, it's, it's about being present and enjoying it because that's, the best part about it and you know the fact that um like you've got dedicated mental health uh like sessions at school where you learn about the subject it's like 
that's just ridiculous. Like it, our mental health is like, it's in here. It's, it's who we are. Like that should be sprinkled across everything that we, that we do, everything that we learn. It's like, that is the foundation of our being, our mental health and our physical health. Like that is, that's our foundation. Yeah. It's It's, not another subject. It, it, It enables us to, to enjoy maths or enjoy literacy. Yeah. So the future of education is about like recognizing that we're actually human. We're not like outcome achieving robots. We, we need to be nourished and that is what it is to be human. I don't know if I said that as eloquently (laughs) as I meant it. I can, I can hear some bubbling ideas and what I'm imagining is like this this beautiful future where cross-pollination is occurring across all the different subjects. And we're seeing it already in learning. You know, there are genuine attempts and, and some find it more intuitively, um, I guess, approachable than others in terms of how can I take bits from here and incorporate into this subject. But it, if for those of us in the audience who might be struggling to see, okay, well, I'm a science teacher. How am I supposed to get physical health and mental health into my subject when I have to teach X, Y, Z across the curriculum? Can you paint for us a little bit of a picture of how we might brainstorm ways to get, to get those imaginations working? Well, firstly, it's really hard. Like, you know, we are, we are bound by certain standards because of the curriculum. So, you know, when I'm reimagining the education system, it looks very different and perhaps there isn't a science subject. It's just, you know, it's just part of learning if that's what the young person is interested in. But I think for the purposes of where we are now and with our current constraints, it's a a lot about working out what the individual in your class enjoys and maybe setting, helping them to set goals for the things that they're struggling with and enjoying that process of working out how we start to enjoy something that we don't necessarily enjoy and putting more focus on that process of learning rather than actually learning the outcome of whatever it might be teaching you might be teaching in your in your science class Um, it's those kind of philosophies that we can take towards teaching that will help us actually help young people to enjoy the process of learning rather than the outcomes of learning. And if I can just jump in there, Maz, I think the um, what what we've like touched on here and why it seems a little bit airy fairy is because it um, it's known intuitively. We as educators, as a sports coach working in program development or teachers themselves, know intuitively how certain kids develop and it's different across a whole class group. But what is true for all of us, no matter who we are, is that if our mental and physical well-being is taken care of initially, then everything else is easier. Um, The second point of that is that the research that I'm diving into with Secret Ninja School around physical literacy, which is a concept that I could talk a lot about, but it's um, something that something that I've known intuitively for a long time as a coach, but it has never been measured, like measurable um, is a better word for it. So the the physical literacy frameworks that have been developed over the last only three or four years finally take physical development and measure it alongside social, psychological, cognitive development. Um, And it gives us a way of saying, all right, so that program worked really well. The kids want to do it again. And um, they are talking about it in their own time or doing the things that I've taught them in their own time. Great. So we've seen that it's worked, but why? And that's that's going to be one of the futures, I believe, is working out ways to measure physical and uh, mental well-being that is not simply um, uh, tick this box because we need to make sure that they're mm their mental health is good. Well, you could have science literacy (laughs) that, you know, targets 
the like what like the physical understanding of maybe physical gets replaced with scientific so the scientific understanding the psychological understanding the cognitive understanding the social understanding in order to fully appreciate what science is yeah it's funny you say that cuz you you're both starting to blow my mind a little bit and this piece is going <laughs> everywhere i'm trying to grab them as you were speaking, Courtney, it, it struck me that for many people still this idea of mental health or the notion of why we would need to have, you know, a well-being assigned class activity, if you like, is to prevent depression or to stop anxiety and to, um, you know, get rid of bipolar. And yes, all of these clinical labels are significant and important. And of course, it's not about removing those at all. And yet our mental health continuum is so much more diverse than that. And as I was hearing you talking about science and this idea of, you know, how can you help to empower young people to understand that learning is all about a journey and that part of learning is failing and then looking at, you know, what worked well and where do we need to improve. And actually what that's doing for a young person is building their cognitive flexibility that to your point is more about the preventative mental health work that we need to do so that when a young person, if they do for whatever reason, have a season of, of a clinical distress, actually they've got the cognitive flexibility skills that they need. They've got the critical thinking, they've got the creativity, they've got, you no know, in education, we talk a lot about growth mindset. And I know that a lot of that work is starting to happen in positive education, but I think what excites me about what the two of you are starting to think about, especially moving through into the next generation of, of where we're going, is how might we combine those two things. So well-being literacy I'm familiar with, and I think a lot of our community is familiar with. I'm really curious though, Kieran, because I reckon I'm not the only one. Tell me more about physical literacy and what you're finding in the research in the past in the past couple of years. Well, I... The internet's amazing for so many different reasons. So I, I wrote a blog <laughs> on it recently um, and, I, like, I'll answer your question specifically, but let me just dive into a quick story. <laughs> so I, I wrote a blog on it and I tagged the researcher um, on LinkedIn just to say thank you for him doing, like, one of the lead researchers into physical literacy. And so I'm fresh off a, uh, a Zoom one-hour wonderful conversation with him. He's wow. – um, he works um, for UNESCO on their health and well-being, um, and so a lot of what I'm about to say will come Small from him. Small organization. Just mm. yeah, I don't know if you've heard of it. <laughs> yeah. no. I'll put a link uh, in the show notes in case our audience hasn't. <laughs> yeah. um, so he he also developed Australia's physical literacy framework, um, which was um, commissioned by Sport Australia. It was commissioned in well, it was finished in 2018, and and it hasn't really taken hold but it's very surprising that it hasn't because it answers intuitively like I said before everything that we know as coaches to be true um, and gives us something to work off rather than going why didn't that work and trialing and erroring for ages it allows us as senior educators to go to new educators of young people and be like look if your if your program does this and this and this it will help them so what it is long answer, <laughs> is that um, when, when we talk about outcomes for sport traditionally, we talk about their, the skill acquisition. So if, if I, I was a cricketer as a kid, right, so I really loved watching the, the professionals bowl and I wanted to learn how to bowl, but being a gangly six foot, 15 year old. Um, so what would I have been like a five foot eight, year, like tall boy, all like I could not control my limbs. Um, my, my goal, if it had have simply been to bowl and hit the top of off stump every single time, I would have got dejected before I even started because it, it just was not, possible for me initially and long after other people were able to pick it up I was still not able to pick it up because I was working out these long gangly limbs just focusing on the physical side that's right just focusing on the physical so what happened for me that I was very lucky to have was I had a, a couple of coaches and specifically a dad who were very very patient that they 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 focused on the enjoyment of the process rather than speaking at all about the end result of hitting the top of off stump. So 
I progressed because of that, because I had this wonderful environment that I could not wait to go and hang out with. The coach also facilitated a wonderful social environment. So the first example was like my, um, my, my cognitive, my, my psychological was looked after. Sorry. So I, I was enjoying the process. The second example was it was a great environment. The social was looked after. The cognitive was looked after because I knew the outcome, but it wasn't the focus. Um, and I knew what had to happen, but it wasn't everything because all of the other four walls were looked after physical, psychological, cognitive, and social. Um, and that is physical literacy. The, the concept that when we go and do a movement program, if the program focuses too much on one of those areas and forgets the others, then it doesn't work. I see, I see. So it's not just about removing the focus from the outcome, it's of being that physical outcome, but it's also if your sports program was only social and there was no focus on the physical aspects or the psychological aspects, and to me, this is kind of sounding a little bit about, you know, that we're, that we're wanting to get into that state of flow where our, where our abilities are just outstretched a little bit. And so there's that, that focus and that attention and that present mindedness. Am I kind of getting my finger on the pulse with where we're going here? It's exactly right. And, and again, I'll reiterate this. It's not groundbreaking because the, the state of flow is well known, right? And the, the, the best coaches in the world, uh, like there's a Netflix documentary called The Last Dance and it documents um, Michael Jordan's era of the NBA. It's focused uh, several episodes on the coach's ability to bring the team together. If you look at Ash Barty, her mindset is what has allowed her to become number one in the world for several years now, not her ability. That was, that's obviously needs to be good too, but it's her mindset that sets her apart. So the best coaches have known this for a long time that you can't just focus on one wall of the four walls of their physical development. You need to make sure that they're all taken care of at the same time. Um, and I reference elite pathways, which I'm quite critical of um, because kids are picked up really early for their natural ability. Um, like, you know, there, there are athletes, Glenn McGrath, one of the best ever bowlers for Australia, was not a natural athlete when he was young. It, was, it, it, it took him years. I think he was 15 before he started to show his talent and um, he was nurtured for the fun of it and that, and then he was able to become one of the best ever. So I think we've gone too far in this direction as a country, and I, I probably can speak as the Western world, uh, of we want you to be elite and anything less is not good enough. Mm -hmm. And mental health, Courtney, similar, different? Yeah, I mean... It's interesting. I've, I've found it really interesting watching Kieran kind of go through this process of learning about physical literacy because it's, that's really, it's really similar to, to mental health, right? Like often in mental health, those four walls are spoken about. So taking a framework that underpins, um, this area of essentially nurturing someone mm, um, yeah. and applying it to different spaces like physical health, potentially a science class. Uh, it's, it's a really exciting mm. thing, I think. Having an actual framework that people can apply and use um, is, is pretty powerful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as you say that and knowing your love of nature, it's kind of like if you had a plant, right? And all yeah. you did. <laughs> was just water it. And like you're watering this thing and it's got so much water going on, but you never put it in the sun. You never yep. check to see if it needs any fertilizer. You never give it a tip prune. You don't change its bucket when it starts to grow, if it's going to grow under those conditions. You know, we wouldn't expect our plants to live like that. And yet for some reason over the last however many years, we've gone into this siloed approach of how we raise our young people and ourselves as humans. It doesn't make sense. You're right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Totally. Oh gosh, <laughs> shed so many. I mean, I don't know about our listeners, but definitely for me, there are light bulbs going off left, right, <laughs> and center. And um, if it's okay, Kieran, I'm definitely going to share in in the show notes some of this research you are coming across because I can imagine many people are going to want to pick up and start some of the reading that that you're already ahead of, and particularly your blog post. That would be unreal to share that one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> we've gone everywhere and roundabout. Is there anything that we've missed? Because I really want to move on to a game with you both. But before we do, <laughs> is there anything that we haven't captured? Because I feel like we've just covered the whole of health in, you know, 45 minutes <laughs> that you want to highlight. We were talking a lot about um, values this morning. Mm. And, and you know, when we first started this chat with you, I don't know how long it's been since we started talking. Um, <laughs> that was kind of one of the first things that we talked about, how we really live our values and, you know, Kieran yeah. referenced um, not really having the language to articulate his values when he was younger, but knowing that in innately there was kind of um, something that he knew that wasn't right with the kind of career path that he'd followed. And in both of the work that we're doing, values is a really important um, part of, yeah, working out who you are and the direction that you want to go in and, and to help you make decisions and work out what your purpose is and all those things. Because working out your purpose is not easy. Like mm. it's it's really hard, but nothing good is easy, you know. Like it's yeah. it's often in those uncomfortable states where we don't, know the answer to a question and we have to work it out where the real like good juicy stuff happens mm. um and so yeah I don't know values is just such a big part of who we are and how we've worked out what it is that we want to do with our careers and our lives and and things like that but yeah <laughs> I definitely agree and I think one value that we like just keep springing to mind in all of this, the physical literacy work, but any conversation that we have about mental wellbeing um, and this whole conversation today is, is vulnerability. Mm. Like if, if there's any like takeaway, if, I, if someone was to ask me, so what is, what's one thing I could work on as a sports coach or as an educator of young people, like four to seven year olds, it's, I think it's being vulnerable with them because from that early age, if you can show them that it's okay to not be very good at something, then that goes such a long way to them enjoying the process. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly the same in mental health, right? Like everything that we do at Batia is around lived experience storytelling, which is about getting young people to share their experiences with mental health and, and being vulnerable because we know that that vulnerability breeds connection and it breaks down those, those walls that we put up and those faces that we put on and, and allows us to actually, you know, assess where we're at and be like, look, I'm actually not, not great. But if we don't recognize that, if we don't provide spaces to recognize that, then we can't do anything about it. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we could keep talking about this for hours. Oh, okay. <laughs> And it's funny because you both speak of vulnerability and it's joined the dots. I've been trying to pinpoint what it is about the two of you that is that special spark. And I've spoken to it a couple of times through the interview, <laughs> but, but that's what it is. It's, it's the compassion that you both live and breathe and compassion being a little bit different from empathy. So of course we need empathy. And I think that vulnerability then allows space for empathy for the other person to see someone's perspective, but it's compassion. And it's taking that next step of saying, you know, I can see your struggle and I can see your suffering, or I can see where things might be different. And I want to do something to step in. And uh, yeah, thank you both of you for modeling um, both within yourselves and toward each other, what compassion looks like like and how we can all be that little bit more kind, but also how we might start to think more compassionately about incorporating the whole human into learning <laughs> as we start to nurture these little people from as young as you said, you know, they're, they're learning from day dot. And then Courtney, to the work you're doing all the way through adolescence, through their entire learning experience, there is always space for vulnerability and there is always space for positive role models, for compassion and for thinking a little bit differently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Well, 
I can't let you go without time for a game. <laughs> Are you ready? Oh, yes, yeah. we love you. Hooray. <laughs> because, you know, men in a band together, I know you two probably think you know each other real well, but I'm going to put that <laughs> to the test today with a little game that we like to play, <laughs> Facts About You. <laughs> Oh. And this will be available for our teachers as well as our free fun sheet today. So if you'd like to grab your copy, you can download it from our episode webpage. But let's dive on in. I haven't prepared you at all, so you don't know what's coming. How are you <laughs> <We> feeling? <don't. laughs> I'm excited, a little bit nervous. <laughs> we, uh, I think my mind went to we're hooked on Parks and rec- yeah. Recreation at the moment. Um, I don't know if you've seen that TV yeah. show. We're, we're, we're deep into it. Um, and I haven't. The- I'm going to have to check it out. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's it's, it's a bit of silly. fun. It's just a silly, like, switch off in the evening type show. Um, but one of the recent episodes, one of the characters ran like a, a couple's date show <laughs> simulation. <laughs> and um, the storyline was that these two people who weren't a couple, like, got it, got all the questions right. And then these two people who were a couple and married were like, they got nothing right and they got into a big fight. So. <laughs> I'm like, we're not, we're not married, but we're very close and we're a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good news is I'm not going to ask you to guess about each other, but you may okay. learn something new. All right, so we do this as a rapid fire. <laughs> and given that, Courtney, you went first, I'm going to invite you, Kieran, to, to jump up first okay. and, th- and then, we'll go to, then we'll go to Courtney. So the first question I had for you, the first thing that comes to mind as well, this is all about brainstorming, so ditching the idea you have to get it right and as many ideas as you like are all welcome to the table. But if I was to ask you if you could be an animal, which animal would you be, Kieran? Go. Uh, sea turtle. No explanation. Look at your eyes. <laughs> Courtney. <laughs> Courtney, go. Okay, so I'm thinking I love the ocean, so I wanted to say a sea animal, but then I was like I also would love to fly. So I think I would like to be a bird that, like, goes into the water and, like, ducks under for a while and has a little swim around. Oh, nice. But I don't know what name of what bird. But I got to think about it longer than you. (laughs) A sea turtle versus a seabird. I love that. All together. (laughs) All right, if you could own an island, what would your island be famous for? Are you, Courtney going first or me? You. Me. You. Oh. <laughs> you think you're getting out of the hot seat. It's not happening, Karen. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> My the island would be would be famous for a um, massive community building retreat where people come and learn how to um, be stronger, more passionate community members. That was Amazing. so good. And I and and I want that idea too. <laughs> 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 with lots of like really yummy food and music and games. <laughs> oh, amazing. I'm coming to your island. All right, <laughs> let's switch to some colours. If you could choose a colour that best represented your idea of a vision for the future, what colour would that be? As part of our van life, I met someone recently who has a um, had a free ticket to go and see the – Great Barrier Reef, Great Barrier Reef on Tuesday just this week. So I'm fresh off my first ever experience on the Great Barrier Reef, which is why oh, I said wow. sea turtle. <laughs> um, but we had one of the, the – I've never seen visibility like that. We were looking through about 50 metres of visibility underwater while I was snorkelling. It was incredible. Wow. And it was this just like silky ocean blue. That's the future for me. Oh, beautiful. <laughs> I want to say something bright. I've been playing around with my iPad at the moment doing these little illustrations of people and, like, it's been really fun capturing a person and their colours. So I've been thinking about colours quite a lot recently and when I see it it's, like, bright splashes of orange and and yellow and red and, like, all these warm, bright colours, I think. Amazing. Thank you. Did you learn something new about each other and yourselves? (laughs) <laughs> we we spend like tw- a lot of 24 together. hours a day together we work together you were telling me you together. could have guessed each other's animals stop it no oh, all no. right all right okay but we, we, Maz, we actually talk about this stuff it's so weird like you i mean we've I'm got 24 7 like and it's just the two of us <laughs> so we talk about what animals we would be what colors we would be what 
<laughs> what kind of transport we would be. <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're my kind of humans. I love yeah. it. Now, given you are both in the health space, it would be very unfair of me to throw you in the game seat. Is there a game that you'd like to share with our audience that we could play together today? <laughs> we were thinking about it and I thought that I could actually give you a little taster of a um, Batir program because... <gasps> That would when, be amazing. <laughs> when, when we go and do these programs, um, the goal is to give young people a positive experience talking about mental health. So we want to subvert that expectation that it's going to be all serious and heavy Dark. by yeah. going in there and just like literally having a laugh and kind of taking the piss out of ourselves. And so one of the um, challenges or, or games that we do with them is Would You Rather? So I'm nice. going to do it for you, Maz. Okay. Um, would you rather have spaghetti for hair or sweat maple syrup? Sweat maple syrup, what is that? <laughs> so, like, you're going to smell really nice, but you'll be really sticky and, like, oh, you've just got maple oh, oh, syrup. Oh, 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 not sweat maple syrup for my hair, just sweat maple syrup. Just okay, sweat spaghetti it, yeah. for hair or sweat maple syrup. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's hectic. I'm going to go for spaghetti <laughs> for hair. Spaghetti for hair. I feel like I can style meal. And then yeah. I feel. I was, yeah, right. I could have <laughs> chewed <in> my hair. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Would you rather live in a cave or a tree house? Ooh, a tree house. 100%. A tree house. So I've got a bird's eye view of everything that's going on. Mm. Yep. Beautiful. And Kieran had our last one. All right. Would, it, would you rather um, do a plank? Or play a game where you've got your feet on an exercise ball. You know, one of those big squishy ones you sit at a desk at sometimes. Yes, big, yes, yes, yes. Ones. Yeah, um, yeah. With your feet on an exercise ball and someone else has also got their feet on an exercise ball and in a plank and you have to be the last one standing. <laughs> That is hectic. I don't even know that I could visualize that. So I'm doing a plank on my own or I am with another person with an exercise ball, planking it out, scuffling it out to see who's yeah. going to last the longest. So yeah. I'm the competitive, the competitive part of me can see Jenna on the other side of that ball and I'm going to battle that girl out, planking it on the Swiss ball 100% with spaghetti in my hair from the top of our treehouse and we're really going to hope that we go, go toppling it out because maybe the cave would have been a safer option. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, you two. That was such a fun game. I love that. And to your point, you know, there are so many different ways that we can encourage young people to be vulnerable and to share mm -hmm. big ideas and to open up parts of themselves without having to get too dark and heavy. So thank you. I appreciate you taking us through such a, a valuable game and I hope our listeners will enjoy it too. <laughs> How can they keep in touch with you both to follow your journeys, see this incredible van life experience that you're having, follow Ninja School and Batia? What's the best way to keep in contact? Um, we're all over Instagram at the moment. So, yeah, you are. Um, at, yeah, we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's the um, best. I am a yeah. huge following Very fan. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we we post a lot of our, like, adventure stuff on our Secret Ninja School page, which is at Secret Ninja School, um, and it's a secret. So if you're listening, please don't tell anyone else about it. Shh. Tell everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's probably the best place. And if you want to see the good work that Batir is doing, I'm so proud of what we do. Just give us a follow at Batir Oz. So B A T Y R A U S. Oh, amazing. I'll be sure to put those links in our show notes. Thank you to you both for joining us from sunny Port Douglas. Get back uh -huh. out there amongst the reef. I'm so pleased to hear that the visibility is doing well. Look after the sea turtles and the seabirds. I can't <laughs> wait to see you when you travel on back down to Port Macquarie. We will yes. catch up IRL very soon, I'm sure. <laughs> That's all we've got time for today. Thank you for listening again to Classroom 5.0. It's been an absolute joy to have our guests, Courtney and Kieran, and we will see you later, alligators. Bye. Bye. Bye.